in the land of opportunity. From the beginning, I had a family that supported me in sports, school, and my faith. I was fortunate enough to be able to travel inside and outside of the United States. I was told to take risks, to challenge myself, and to jump at every opportunity that came my way. As an aspiring journalist, it was my goal to become a news reporter immediately after college but I was given the opportunity to be a host and a producer for a travel show. This opportunity opened many doors for me, including traveling the world, filming two seasons of travel shows, and even taking home a couple of Emmys. This has brought me to where I am today. I own my own production company, and I'm still filming documentaries around the world. You know, I was able to gain a perspective from all of these travels that I never thought I'd have as a little girl. 3.8 billion, a large number. A number that constitutes the estimate amount of women living around the world in 195 countries. While I am just one of 3.8 billion, through my travels, I have learned that there are wonderful women all around the world, and they are all unique. In a world full of stereotypes and prejudices, maybe based off of news stories or some statistic, I thought that I wanted to experience life with these women, whether that was in a rural tribe in Africa or a former war-torn country, Perhaps it was even in a modern and advanced society. I wanted to know what it was like to be judged. I wanted to know what it was like to be a different race or religion than everybody else. This is a quote that I've always liked to say through my travels, that I am most comfortable when I am uncomfortable. Traveling has become sort of a lifestyle for me, and I will say that feeling uncomfortable has become a routine. It's become such a routine that I actually enjoy it. So my solution was I wanted to film a TV series and write a book where I could explore the world through her eyes. This is Garion and she lives in Nairobi, Kenya. Nairobi is about a five-hour drive north of Nairobi. She is part of the tribe called Samburu. And to be honest, we don't really know how old she is because they don't keep track of this sort of thing. However, it's believed that she was married at around nine years old, she has five kids, and she wants six more. Her husband has multiple wives and even more children in nearby villages. Every day, she tends to her goats, and that's how they make their money, and she prays that they'll have enough food to eat on the table every night. I went to live in Nairobi, and I can tell you, in all of my travels, I have never had such a fear as in when I went to Kenya. I contacted the Croatian priest, who was the one who arranged the translator that would be with us, and I had him reassure me that I would make it out alive. When we arrived, I knew I would have no cell phone service, and my biggest fear was that we would have some kind of medical emergency, because we were literally in the middle of nowhere. But when I arrived to the hut, this was my home, uh, our translator met us and introduced me to Garion. I immediately put on the traditional outfit and tried to immerse myself into the culture. 
And I can tell you, it was shocking, all of it. I thought that the cute young children would be so thrilled to play with me as I ran up to them with a smile, but instead they ran, screamed, and some even cried. I learned that I was the first white person that they had ever seen. Luckily, I was able to warm them up a bit by giving them a lollipop. And I say, just imagine if we could solve all of our world's problems with a lollipop. One of my first tasks in the tribe was to milk the goats with Gaudion. Luckily, I had some experience in this field. So I chased the goats around this spiky pen that was supposed to keep the hyenas out. And I was so careful not to even lose the smallest drop of milk because I knew how important this was for the family. They survived off of this milk in the morning, and then in the evening they ate some kind of mash concoction. I can assure you that my crew and I ate peanut butter sandwiches every day as we did not want to get sick. But you know, what they did was they really accepted me into this tribe, even if I didn't want to try something new. Now, the next day I went on a spiritual walk with only the women in the tribe. This was an hour and a half journey in 40 degree temperatures. It was scorching hot. And after 15 minutes, I can tell you we had enough footage for the show. But because I didn't want this to be another fake reality show, I stuck it out, and we trekked for an hour and a half to the religious site, and then an hour and a half back. They sang and danced, and I tried to follow along. They laughed at me mainly, but the main thing was that I was respectful of their culture, and they accepted me into theirs. On the last day, two moments really stood out for me. The first one was, they decided they were going to sacrifice a goat in my honor of visiting them. And as much as I am a full-on meat-loving human, I really did not need to see the process. Uh, well, as I stood there, I was okay for a while, but then when one of the villagers went over and started drinking the blood of the goat and offering it to me, this is when I proceeded to gag. Uh, <laughs> You know, I asked her why she was drinking this blood, and she told me that it was giving her energy. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure I can find energy in many other ways. <laughs> but the second moment that stood out to me was when I took Gaudion to the schoolhouse where a few of her daughters attended. I know that Gaudion never had a day of school in her life, so I taught her how to write her name. We slowly traced the dots, and what was the powerful moment was when we went back to the village, I saw her writing her name in the dirt. And here I have a picture of her showing her family, some of her family, how she learned to write her name. In the interview that I finished up at the end of the week of being there, I asked her, what was your favorite part of having a visitor? And she said, I learned to write my name. The crew and I obviously made it out of the tribe alive. And the funniest thing of it all was she actually said, oh, I would love to keep in touch with you. And I thought, well, considering we're only communicating with smiles and then, of course, the translator, this would literally be impossible since they're nomadic. I mean, I would never be able to find her again. But the important thing is I can share her story. I can share that, you know, everyone around has similarities. And when, I, when she asked me, well, who's going to see this? I said, it'll be on television. And she says, what's that? <laughs> I challenge you to educate and form your own opinions of what is right or wrong by looking through someone else's eyes. Living with these women allowed me to gain an insight of how they view the world. I was able to find out what we have in common and then share ideas about how we can grow and live productively. This is Mimosa, and she lives in Kosovo. She's 25 years old, and she feels trapped. She's hardworking, educated, 
but doesn't have the freedom to travel to all the places that she desires. She became a psychologist, and she experienced a type of trauma no one should experience at five years old. Twenty years ago, drunken policemen raided their home and shot people right in front of her eyes. Today, she has to walk by this house every single day. You know, Mimosa became my friend. She showed me all around her country. I asked her what it was like being a young Muslim woman. She told me that, yes, their country had conflicts with the surrounding neighbors. But it's so often we all have some kind of conflict, whether that's a neighbor or a surrounding country. But the important thing was she was happy to share her story. She let me ask the questions and put the prejudices aside. We were able to come up with a better understanding. Well, I'm just at the beginning of understanding women around the world, I know this. Not all upbringings, desires, and opportunities are the same, but each woman has a spirit, a tenacity, and a story that deserves to be told. Equality is not equal across the world, but we're able to take these stories and show them firsthand how we can appreciate women, no matter where they come from. Before I leave you, I hope you'll join me in opening your eyes to the world and recognizing that whether man or woman, black or white, Muslim or Christian, we all have a story and we are all human. Thank you.